Hello, welcome to the channel. Today we're doing kind of a buyer's guide walk around on my 1996 F-150. It is a four-wheel drive, 351 powered automatic truck. I've had it for about three years. I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, the only change I would make to it is I'd rather have the manual transmission. Uh, this will be kind of what I would look for in one of these if I was going to go look to buy one. So let's get started. Uh, usually when I start talking to a seller about their vehicle I ask them basic things like you know motor, transmission, if it wasn't in the ad, how well does it run, does it have any problems, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, I do not make offers on trying to negotiate the price until I see the vehicle in person. Uh, I find that it's rather insulting to try to lowball a guy if you've never even seen his vehicle in person. And of course I've sold many vehicles and I usually just delete the messages right then and there as soon as a guy just pops out and asks me, uh, what's your bottom dollar for it? Uh, what is, what's the lowest you'll take for it? Before he's even seen or asked a single question about the vehicle. So anyway, let's get started. First thing you'll notice, just walking up to the truck, there's a funny gap between the door and the fender. You walk up a little closer, and you can see that someone has actually cut that fender to clear the door. So that tells me that there is body damage. Something's not right with this fender. Then you look at this body gap right here, See how it's wider in the front and gets narrow up there by the cowl? Front clip's not aligned right. Something's going on. The gaps are opposite over here, tight in the corner and big at the cowl. So what that tells me is that front clip is shifted to the driver's side and potentially pushed back. So then you want to crawl under and look at the frame rails. It is hard to tell exactly if the frame rails are damaged by just crawling under unless there's like an obvious kink or a tweak or something. Usually the easiest way to see if these are bent is to pull the bumper off the truck. That'll give you a good straight on look at the frame rails. But most sellers don't want you taking their truck apart, so ask lots of questions. Hey, has this been in a crash? Do you know if it's been in a crash? Did you crash it? Just uh, kind of poke around a little bit, see see what he tells you, see if he starts lying to you, or uh, or maybe he'll come right out and tell you. There is a uh, center cap missing right there. A common problem, especially on these trucks with aluminum wheels, is that these little pins are where your center cap bolts to. These are made of plastic. They go through the aluminum. People will over tighten these and break the back of this plastic piece that, and then it'll start to pull out of the wheel. So then your center cap has problems. They do sell kits with these brand new. I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet but you can replace these. And I do have the center cap for this truck. If you're looking at a truck and it's missing the center cap, make sure you ask the guy if he has it. Because uh, these aren't impossible to find, but you don't want to have to go looking for them if you don't have to. They made these in two colors on these trucks with the center, little center emblem there. These will be either black or red. I actually have a full set of both colors, but like a moron, I didn't prep enough for this video to pull the red ones out to show you. But those are factory style aluminum wheels, and they're getting fairly hard to find. As I come around on this side, you can see there's a little rust up here in the, the uh, lip of the fender well. That is very, very common problem on these trucks. They collect dirt and moisture behind that beauty ring and 
or not the beauty ring, that uh, trim ring, and it just rots out the metal. Another big thing on these trucks. I have not seen it on the three quarter tons or one tons, but I've seen it on a lot of half tons, and it's really bad on the Rangers. Those spring hangers right there will rust out, and uh, if they completely fail, it'll put that leaf spring up into the floor of the of the bed of your truck. So you want to take a damn good look at those, especially the rear ones. The rear ones seem to be the worst on it. They catch everything. I replaced these right after I bought the truck. But they're about 150 bucks a pair, so be prepared to spend some money. And that's a good negotiating point on the price. If those are rotted out and you know you got to replace them, count on $150 and at least a few hours of your time if you have all the right tools, or probably a couple hundred dollars to have a shop replace them, if you can even find a shop that'll do it. While we're down here, we're going to look at the front ones. You can see this one's getting pretty rusty. It's going to need changed before too long. Let's see just how bad this is. Yeah, see the rust is flaking off. It's not rotted out yet, it's still a lot of surface damage. But those do need replaced from time to time as well. I do have a set of these for the front. Uh, they were another hundred dollars for the pair. It is kind of a job to replace them. You have to come in here and grind these rivets, rivet heads off or cut them off without getting into the frame rail and then take this bracket off but you also have to unbolt the spring and support the axle and it's kind of an involved job if you especially if you don't know what you're doing while you're back here you want to take a look at the condition of the frame make sure there's no problems with it Ugh, let me get off my ass here Coming back around to the driver's side here, you want to look at your door alignment, make sure it all looks good, look down the side of the truck, see if there's any damage that you wouldn't notice looking at it head on. Come around and look at this fender lip, see this one's got a little bit of rust starting on it too. Look at your fuel doors. Make sure they're not rusted. Make sure there's actually a fuel tank in there. You want to ask the seller about the fuel tanks because almost all of these came with dual tanks. So you want to ask them if both tanks work, if the gauge works, if the gauge is accurate, if the switchover is right. Because a lot of times the switchover to go from one tank to the other won't work. There's a specific name for it, crossover valve or something like that. Uh, I'm not real technical on that but sometimes those will fail and only one tank will be operable. Uh, bad grounds and bad connections will cause problems with the fuel gauge. It will either read inaccurate or it won't read at all, so be aware of that. Now, we mentioned the potential front end damage earlier. This is a matching door, but it's got evidence of a plastic visor on it. Huh. Okay. But it's broke off. Is there one on the other side? No. And there's no evidence of one. Okay. That door's been replaced. So the damage on the fender extended to the door. Hmm. Curious. So that's more things to ask about. Also, I noticed on this side, this is a good note. The original assembly plant sticker for the window. 
That is the original windshield on this truck from 1996. Speaking of the year, 1995, 96, and early 97 are OB, or OBD2 trucks. Sorry. That means you can plug a scanner into these and scan the vehicle for codes. Now, the codes are kind of limited. They're not as thorough as later OBD2 vehicles, but you can get a lot of good basic information on these. And if I remember correctly... Yeah, there's the connector right there for the data link. And there is your... Uh, deal for reading codes with an OBD2 scanner. Now on a side note, this particular truck has extra paperwork that comes with it. And it's uh, pretty rare to find these. This is the original window sticker from the Ford dealership where this truck was sold brand new. Give you all a second to read that and you know, screenshot it if you want to. That is a pretty cool piece right there. But this particular truck gets even cooler. We have an envelope. 92895 96 F154 by 4 six miles on it. Okay, what have we got in here? What kind of treats and trinkets have we discovered? An original leather-bound owner's book for this truck. Inside we see all of our service and owner's manuals and the salesman who sold this truck brand new. We have the sales consultant and the service representative. Four-wheeling with Ford, roadside assistance, tire warranties, Quite a bit of history of the vehicle here. Might as well move on to the interior while we're here. Decent enough. Carpets are good. They're a little dirty, but you know, no horrible stains or anything like that. Move the seat forward. Grab that lever and roll it forward. It should stay put. There's my toolbox. Here's your back seat. That bottom half flips forward like completely over and then that flips down and you get a solid storage surface back here it's all flat the Chevy's didn't do that but the Ford's did pretty nice little little touch there from Ford you notice the headliner is in excellent shape no rips no tears no stains nothing sagging anywhere and I did talk to the guy I bought it from. He did not put a headliner. This is the original headliner from 1996. I am the third owner on this truck, by the way. Put our seat back. That is a switch for lumbar support. You can hear the motor run. So it's supposed to deflate it and inflate it. But the bladders aren't working. It means one of two things. Something's not connected, or there is something damaged in there, or these are not the original seats to this truck. I happen to know that these are not the original seats. They were replaced. I do not know exactly why. This was originally a bucket seat truck, but they changed the seats out at some point. And the lumbar does not work on either seat. They do not inflate. Here we have an aftermarket stereo. I put that in, but you do want to ask a seller if they installed it or not, because that does make a difference. Uh, you don't know if they did it right or not. Uh, I do have the original radio to this truck. So, you know, with all this documentation here, 
Yeah, I definitely kept any original part that I took off of the truck. Now we're going to get the keys, and we're going to make sure all, all the gauges work. When you turn the key on, but not to the run position, all of your dash lights should come on. It's a test circuit to make sure that they're working. If they don't all come on, like for instance if the check engine light doesn't come on at this stage, then someone has disconnected the bulb for that, which means they're trying to hide something. Here we go. Key to the on position. Check engine lights on. After a few seconds, that should turn off. If it doesn't, you have a code to check. Now, I happen to have already scanned this truck. It does have a code for the mass airflow sensor. Those typically get dirty or foul with age. I do need to replace it they're around a hundred dollars for a decent one. I don't know what the Ford or factory ones cost. I should probably look into that though because that's the better one to get. But anyway, we'll look at our gauges. This is a digital odometer. So those are the miles on the truck. 149,154.9 miles. Of course, the truck's cold, so it shouldn't read any coolant temperature, and uh, there's your fuel level, and your uh, battery gauge, this is your oil pressure gauge. Now we will go ahead and start it, see how fast it starts, and see what the gauges do. Stuttered a little bit on start. That is probably due to a dirty mass airflow sensor. You see our oil pressure came up. It's wiggling a little bit. Those gauges, well, all these gauges are known for some issues of many different sorts. You see how it jumped all the way up to M? Those gauges are dummy gauges. That does not mean your oil pressure is high or low or anything like that. It's just simply reading that there is pressure. It could be 10 pounds of oil pressure. It could be 100 pounds of oil pressure. That gauge is not telling you if it's high or low accurately. It is just telling you that there is oil pressure. Same thing with the coolant temp. It'll get up into the normal range and then stop at some point. Uh, every truck's a little different as to where the needle will sit. My uh, daughter just got home. But, yeah, these gauges don't tell you anything specific. If you want specific readings, get mechanical gauges for the truck. Now, our front wheels are straight. Steering wheel's off. A little more than a quarter turn. That's curious. More evidence of damage. So you want to check the front suspension, you want to look at the alignment, make sure the tires aren't wearing funny. These tires are wearing good, so someone has had it aligned. I did align this truck right after I bought it. The alignment was one and a half inches off. So I aligned it and it has not chewed any tires. Those tires have been on this truck for three years since the day I bought it. Got your cruise control buttons and your horn buttons, and this is an airbag wheel. You want to check this up here. This is there's a button on the end of this shifter to lock out your overdrive for when you're pulling a trailer, so you reduce the risk of burning up the transmission. Click the button on. It turns it off and lights up the the off logo. Switch it again, and it turns the overdrive back on. You also want to check your four-wheel drive buttons. In these trucks, they are an electric button. See that button lights up for four-wheel drive. Low range should do the same thing, but this button doesn't come up on the 
it doesn't light the secondary on the bulb, so you want to take note of that. And you want to make sure it turns back off. You can hear the solenoid click. Go ahead and shut this truck off. If your state has inspections, you want to go through and check anything that's related to an inspection. Make sure the windshield's not cracked. Make sure all your mirrors are functional properly. Uh, you want to make sure the horn works. Uh, you want to check all your lights and turn signals. Uh, you know, just all your whatever your state requires for inspection. In Missouri, we also have to have a catalytic converter on anything built 1980 and newer, so make sure all that's there. That's going to do it for, for this video in particular. I uh, hope this was helpful to somebody, and I hope you enjoyed it. Till next time. Bye. So I was going to end the video with what I recorded on the previous section, but uh, then I remembered a few other things that could be helpful when you're looking at these trucks. Uh, first of all, a little more rust that I forgot that you should look out for. This truck doesn't have it, but it is very common to see rust down here in the extended cab section. Now there is a little seam there. I believe I touched on that in the first part of this video, and uh, I think that's a lead-filled seam and it's separated. I do need to do something about that but typically it'll rust back here because that's a double layer piece of metal there so it will rust between the two I'll see if I can get you a shot of it see if you can see how that's put together nah it's too dark but anyway you can see two pieces of metal are spot welded together here so moisture will collect in there and cause rust and it'll rust jack this apart sometimes but it also build up back here and rust out the bottom of this piece right here so be aware of that you may be able to spot it coming out from the back side before you see it on the front side other than that uh, something about the transmissions in these trucks if it has the automatic overdrive set up I showed you in the first part how you push this little button here and it'll turn the overdrive off and on. Well, when these transmissions have problems, as they are an electronically assisted shift, this will flash off and on. And that's an indication that the transmission has a serious problem or an impending problem. Either way, the transmission needs to be serviced if that light is flashing. Other than that, all I have to add on this video are engine options. I guess I could open the hood. That would be somewhat intelligent and germane to the conversation. Oh, let's see if I can get this open. There we go. It's hard to do one-handed. All right, this truck has the 5.8 liter 351. These are pretty reliable motors. Uh, I've put the screws to this one a few times and it just keeps asking for more. Uh, they, these typically leak a little bit of oil at the kind of mileage this truck has on it. This truck's at 150,000 miles. Uh, keep an eye on your rear main seals, your oil pan gaskets, things like that. Uh, the uh, AC compressor clutch failed on this truck with the previous owners, so he just took it apart and now it just runs like a bypass pulley. I uh, don't know if I'm going to fix that yet or not. Uh, your other engine options in the half ton models would be the 5.0 or 302 V8 and the 300 cubic inch or 4.9 liter inline 6. An issue that the inline sixes commonly have, uh, if they've been worked hard or overheated, they will crack down the center of the head. Uh, it's not a super common issue, like don't think that every inline six you see is going to have a cracked head, uh, but be leery of ones that have been abused and not maintained. 
the 302, a lot of guys are like, oh, it's got a 5 and Okay. A 5.0 in a Mustang and a 5.0 in a 3,500, 4,000 pound pickup. Uh, two totally different animals. Okay, that 302 is plenty to move a Mustang down the road and have lots of fun. And if you have a two door, short bed, two wheel drive F 150, it'll move that down the road pretty decent as well. But if you're an extended cab or a long bed or four wheel drive, uh, the 302 lacks a little power. Yes, you can build them up, but this video is primarily for stock setups. So, the stock 302, you may be disappointed with it going down the road. If you need towing power, but you don't want a big block, or you can't afford the diesel, the 351 is the way to go. This motor has plenty of pulling power. The weak point on this truck would be the transmission. That transmission will give up the ghost way before that engine does. Unless, of course, you do something stupid like run the motor out of oil or overheat the uh, hell. <coughs> excuse me, overheat the hell out of it. Uh, I'm pretty damn happy with the with the 351 here. Uh, it's a little rough on fuel, but it's a truck. Okay, if you think you're going to get 25, 30 miles to the gallon out of a full size four wheel drive truck. I might suggest you have your head examined. Okay, trucks of this era are for work. Okay, they did put some style into them. They do look nice, but these are not economy vehicles. Okay, these are meant to be workhorses. They are geared to pull. Now, granted, half tons don't pull a whole lot, but they do okay. If you really need to pull, I recommend a F-250 or F-350. If you want some resemblance of fuel economy, get the diesel. The diesel in these would be a 7.3 liter turbo diesel, also known as the Power Stroke. Everybody thinks they're made of gold. They're decent motors. They were better with lower miles, but, you know, as they age, and people think they're worth a mint because they're of a collector age, I see diesels all the time that don't run or don't run well or have bad transmissions, and guys are asking six, seven, eight. Ten thousand dollars for them, like uh, guys, you've lost your mind. Nobody's paying that kind of money, and if you are paying that kind of money for one, more power to you. You got more money to waste than I do. Three fifty one would do you just fine. Uh, in the three quarter ton and one tons, uh, you also get the option of the four sixty uh, big block V eight. It's a fine motor. They do well. They pull well. But they make absolutely horrendous fuel economy. So, if you need to compromise, if you need some sort of economy, but you also need, you know, a heavier chassis for pulling a trailer, if you're doing cross country, get the diesel, it's going to be your best bet. Just don't pay too much for it, you know. Do your research, learn the market, pay accordingly. Uh, don't use the 460 for cross-country travel. If, if you never leave the county or the tri-county area, the 460 will do you just fine. Just be prepared to shell out some money for fuel. Uh, but I like to compromise at the 351. It's got plenty of power for what I want to do and, and a fair amount of economy for what it is. Uh, I would not want this motor in a one-ton dually. But a one-ton single-wheel truck that's just a little bit lighter and geared a little different, uh, 351 does just fine. Uh, the kind of loads you would pull with a dually, the 351 will do it, but you're going to wear it out quicker than you would the diesel or the 460. Anyway, I think that's about all I've got for this video. I hope you learned something from it. Uh, this mostly pertains to the 92 to 96 and early 97 trucks, as stated before. Uh, I would make videos on the 80 to 86 and the 87 to 91, but I don't have examples of those here. I had an 89 here, but I didn't get the video made for it in time. But a video for the 89 would have been very similar to this. There's very few differences, mainly just cosmetics. Uh, the chassis are very similar, the engine options are very similar. Uh, well, they're essentially the same, it's just the fuel system's a little different.
But anyway, uh, until next time, bye.